Okay, good morning. Uh, okay. Today's lecture is IP equals P space. Maybe you've seen parts of it before, uh, but I cannot rob you of this one. This is a famous theorem in complexity theory from around 1990, and it kicked off like a wave of uh, cool theorems. This is sort of the first in the uh, succession that culminated around 1993 with this other theorem called uh, the PCP theorem. Uh, another famous theorem. In the meantime, there are also theorems called uh, uh, MIP equals NEXP and some other such things. Um, it's considered a bit of a shocking theorem at the time. Uh, one reason is that it's a relationship between complexity classes that, again, uh, does not relativize. And in fact, um, prior to it being proved, there were like oracles showing that uh, IP did not equal P space relative to these oracles. So people generally believe that this was not true. Uh, but then it turned out to be true, so sometimes that happens. And uh, it also shows sort of like the very amazing strength and power of both randomness and interaction in the context of proofs. Okay, so to uh, remind you, if I haven't already mentioned it, this class uh, IP was originally invented um, for cryptographic reasons, but it's the class of all uh, languages that have uh, interactive proof. And in the terminology that we've already used, we can think of this as like Arthur Merlin interactive proofs, but where you allow polynomially many rounds. Okay, so, um, you know, we uh, first studied Arthur Merlin interactive proofs where there was some, you know, fixed number of rounds K, and we actually showed that um, whenever you have a fixed number of rounds K, it's equivalent to just having two rounds. But, in fact, if you allow, um, and you get the class that's just called AM, but if you allow polynomially many rounds, which is uh, this class IP interactive proofs, you actually end up getting something much bigger, P space. Um, okay, so uh, the main um, part of this theorem that IP equals P space is this part right here, that um, P space is a subset of IP. The other direction is, let's say, an exercise, or it's, it's not hard, it's that um, IP is a subset of P space. Pretty much all like kind of like reasonable <laughs> classes that involve polynomial boundedness are in P space. It's generally an upper bound on most reasonable things. And indeed, you can show that if you have a language that's in IP, you know, computing uh, the probability that like uh, Merlin will win with a given strategy can be done in polynomial space by evaluating some game tree. It's like a polynomial depth and exponential branching factor. Okay, so it's relatively straightforward to see that anything that has an inter uh, interactive proof is in P space. And uh, that was long known, um, but you know, prior to this theorem, you know, prior to 1989, people generally believed that like IP was maybe the same thing as AM, constant round interactive proofs. So they didn't actually know anything that you could uh, do with polynomially many rounds of proof interaction that you couldn't do with two rounds of proof interaction. But uh, that turned out not to be true. So actually. Um, I guess this was probably in 89 that um, Nissan figured it out and then maybe it was improved by uh, these people, Lund, Fortnow, Karloff, and Nissan. Nissan. Uh, they showed that um, SharpSat or Sharp3Sat or whatever has interactive proofs. And a consequence of this is that P to the sharp P is contained in IP and this is like an enormous class. It was already known at the time that this contains the polynomial time hierarchy. It contains um, yeah, everything in the polynomial time hierarchy, which proves that actually IP is a, a big class, much bigger than presumably a AM. You know, at the time it wasn't even thought that Cohen P was in IP, uh, but then it was shown. And then, you know, they published that, and then like two weeks later, like Shamir improved it to show that TQBF, this is a complete problem for uh, P space, is also in IP. You know, it proves that P space is a subset of IP, and therefore they're equal. Um, okay, so as is traditional when dealing with IP equals P space, we're going to like first prove this one, and then we'll attempt to do this one. Honestly, I always find like this proof like s quite like painful and annoying, and this captures like most of the uh, ideas and the utility. And this is really an important proof to know, or a prone fact to know, so we'll, we'll attempt to do it. Um, okay, any questions? All right. <coughs> Uh, right, so as I said, we're going to do this one first. Okay, and the problem here that we'll get to in a second is you have like a 3 CNF formula, and uh, you want to know how many satisfying assignments it has. Um, 
And uh, there's going to be a way for like some, you know, Merlin with polynomially many rounds of interaction, uh, interaction to convince you of the exact number of satisfying assignments it has. Um, but before we get to that, let me actually just set up like a slightly more general scenario, which will occupy us for most of the, the class and the, in particular, the proof of this. So more generally, um, let's say you have some polynomial called f in n variables. And let's say it has some degree bound d. OK, and think of d as being polynomial in n. OK, so it's a polynomial uh, in n variables of uh, poly n degree. And let's say it's also over the field of integers mod p, where um, p is some prime. And it's a big prime, so p, this is not the most important aspect of it, but some big prime, let's say a uh, prime with about two times n digits. And let's imagine that this prime is like known to both uh, Merlin and Arthur. And let's also imagine like um, Arthur, and also Merlin, but in particular Arthur, can evaluate uh, f. Okay, so bear in mind here, uh, this maybe make uh, a little bit more sense when I give a concrete example, but um, this f is n variables and polynomial degrees. So I mean, the number of coefficients you need to represent it is like exponential in n. So we're not imagining that like f is like literally written down for everyone to see, but like f, Arthur has some implicit representation of it. Um, it's going to be basically something that just encodes the given Boolean formula so that he can at least compute with it. For example, maybe in general you might imagine Arthur has some kind of algebraic circuit that like computes f. Okay, so Arthur has the ability to evaluate f um, and Merlin is all powerful so Merlin can do whatever he wants. And we're going to be considering Merlin trying to prove claims about f to Arthur of the following form. So this will occupy us for quite some time, consider a claim made by Merlin of the following form. The sum over all, it's not over very much, but over all x's that are 0 or 1, and the sum over all x2's that are 0 and 1, all the way from the sum over xn being 0 or 1, of x, f of x1 through f of xn equals C, okay, and this is all mod P. Okay, we're going to more generally consider Merlin trying to prove claims of this form to Arthur. Okay, and this is just saying like, hey, if you sum F's values over all possible Boolean inputs, there's two to the end Boolean inputs here, then you get some number C, mod P. Okay, and we're going to show more generally that uh, with polynomially many rounds, Merlin can, you know, convince Arthur of these statements when they're true. Okay, so in particular, you know, there's an interactive proof system for this. And just to remind you what that means, it means the following. Uh, if the claim is true, You know, Arthur will accept with high probability. In fact, will accept with probably one. It's even nicer. And if it's false, Arthur will uh, reject with high probability. And again, I uh, should technically insert some more words here. If the claim is true, then there exists some strategy that Mar Merlin can use to give his responses to Arthur such that Arthur will accept with probability 1. And conversely, if it's false, no matter what stuff Merlin tries to tell Arthur, he'll uh, reject the claim with high probability. Okay. So we sometimes refer to this scenario as with an honest Merlin, and this is with like a cheating Merlin. Okay, so um, why is this um, more general, or why does this include the 
the problem that I claimed we were going to talk about, showing that Sharp 3 SAD is as interactive proof systems. Well, um, let's think about that scenario. Okay, so, you know, um, for Sharp 3 SAT, you know, the input is some 3CNF that looks like this, phi of x is, um, I don't know, x1 or x3 bar or x6 bar and x2 bar or x5 and dot, dot, dot. Okay, so each clause has at most three literals. Let's say there are m clauses. Okay, and we can assume that m is order n squared cubed because, you know, there's only so many triples of literals. And, um, you know, Merlin is interested in convincing Arthur how many x's satisfy this. And just the simple trick is that you can kind of arithmetize this formula into a polynomial, which has the property that it's 0 or 1, depending on whether, on a Boolean input, depending on whether the formula is made true or false. Okay, and I'll just show you that by example. Um, for this one, you would say, okay, let this f be, um, okay, you just need to get something that's 0 or 1, depending on whether this clause is true. So I think I want 1 minus 1 minus x1, x3, x6. Let's take a look at that. Uh, if x1, all the x's are 0, 1, a product is usually 0, which means this whole thing is usually 1, except in one case, the case when x1 is 0, x3 is 1, and x6 is 1. Uh, what's that? So this is an or, which is usually 1 in most circumstances. This is like 1 minus a product, which is usually 1 minus 0. So it's also usually 1. There's one case when this is 0. It's when x1 is 0, x3 is 1, x6 is 1. And that should be the same thing here. OK. Anyway, something like this is true. I think this is it. But if not, you can correct it. Um, so then similarly, this would be 1 minus uh, x2 times 1 minus x5, OK, et cetera. We multiply them all together. OK, and so then this f is only, well, this f, each term here is 1 or 0. Let me just write it down. I mean, for an input x that's in 0, 1 to the n, f of x is 1 if x satisfies phi and 0 else. OK, because f is only 1 if each of the terms is made 1. Um, OK, so this is kind of like the situation I was imagining where like f is, let's just take a look here, um, f is a polynomial in n variables. What can we say about the degree of f? Well, each of these little terms has degree at most 3, and we're multiplying together m of them. So it's at most 3m, which is also order n cubed. So indeed, we're in this scenario where the degree is polynomially bounded in n. And indeed, like, you know, Arthur, like, kind of knows f. And, like, if you give Arthur any concrete numbers to plug into f, he can do it because he knows this formula. And in particular, he can even do it um, if these numbers are not 0 and 1, if they're in, like, this uh, field, z mod p. OK, because, you know, a, a field element is just an integer mod p. That's 2n bits. So the numbers can never get, like, too large, you know, as these, like, adding and multiplying and so forth numbers, I mean, he's always reducing the mod p, so he's always keeping around n bits. So that's the sense in which like f can compute f, even though he somehow doesn't exactly know it explicitly in terms of its coefficients. Um, good. So in this case, um, if, you know, Arthur and Merlin both mentally agree on this polynomial, then um, this claim star is equivalent to the claim that like the number of satisfying assignments for phi is uh, c mod p. Are so cannibalize those phenomena like even not mod p but like uh, in any number from 0 to p as access, he can relate like exactly what the variable is 
Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we want mod p because we're going to eventually do a trick that like we're always doing these things like picking random inputs and again like over the integers there's not really a notion of a random integer but there's a nice notion of a random number mod p. I mean you can pick a random number mod p but then like not mod p but like from one just from one to p and then over there it's direct. That's true. You'll, you'll see it come up. Okay. I mean, this, this, this is always like going my prime. We've seen it like many times. Like, it's a bit of a technical device, but it's okay. Uh, let me just add that, like, um, so this, you know, is like the kind of thing that like Merlin is claiming at the beginning. And let me just like mention that like this mod p is not really a big deal. See, since p is like much, much bigger than 2 to the n. Um, uh, you know, C is supposed to be somewhere between 0 and 2 to the n. So, you know, doing it mod P is the same as not doing it uh, not mod P. It's the same as, you know, not mod P. I mean, in other words, like if, you know, Arthur or Merlin claims some number, C mod P between 0 and 2 to the n, if you can convince um, Arthur of that it's that value mod p, then Arthur's convinced it's simply that value because, you know, Arthur obviously knows it's between 0 and 2 to the n. Good. Um, so that sort of sets up the thing that Merlin would like to claim, the exact number of satisfying assignments, into this, you know, slightly more mathematical looking form. Um, let me mention, like, a small thing here. Um, we're going to have an interactive proof for... Uh, a proof system for claims like this. You know, at the very beginning, Merlin can send p to Arthur. Okay, that's just two n bits, one round. Um, and, you know, it's not going to, as long as p is indeed, you know, bigger than 2 to the n, around, let's say, 2 n bits long, it's cool. Arthur can check in deterministic polynomial time that the thing Merlin sent over is really a prime. Well, actually, Arthur can use randomness, find like such a big prime uh, himself. Um, but uh, maybe only with high probability. So if we use the trick of having Merlin send it, then we can Arth have Arthur succeed with probability one in the good case. Okay, so what I want to say is uh, we're sort of all set up to go. Uh, at the beginning, uh, Merlin will send over this prime that they'll use for the rest of the proof. And um, yeah, and then Merlin will also send over, let's say, C, his claim about, like, what is the number of satisfying assignments for phi? And that implicitly sets up, you know, this star is what Merlin is claiming. And now we'll see an interactive proof that convinces Merlin of this fact when it's true, or else has the property that when it's false, like, Arthur will catch Merlin. Any questions? Okay, so <clears throat> let's say what the protocol is. It's always a little tricky when you're describing interactive proof systems. Like you kind of say like what the protocol is at the same time you describe what Merlin's strategy is. And you usually say like this is what Merlin should do in the true case, like when the answer is true, but you also mentally think about what happens if Merlin's trying to cheat you. So it's a little awkward to describe these all simultaneously, but we'll do our best. So here's a description of the protocol for a claim like star. So uh, Arthur starts off by um, cooking up a challenge for Merlin. So you imagine, I mean, you know, Arthur, if this were like real life, saying these words like, consider the following polynomial, g of a variable y, which equals um, the sum over x2 going from 0 to 1 up to this xn going from 0 to 1 of uh, f of y and then x2 through xn. Okay, so they're staring at this claim and Arthur kind of says, um, check it out Merlin, just look at like this piece. Um, 
So f is some polynomial. Let's mentally imagine that we indeed like summed over all possible x2s and xn's, and then there would be one variable left called x1. But let's not sum over it. In fact, let's just consider it to be a variable, which I've called capital Y to try to decrease confusion. Okay, Maybe to increase confusion. Um, so they can all agree that this is a polynomial. So like this is, in fact, a univariate polynomial. There's only one variable, capital Y. There's no other variables. They've been summed over. In itself, degree, well, I mean, the degree can't go up. So it's at most d. The original f had degree at most d. And can't go up when you sum over some of the variables. Turn them to constants. Uh, it's a poly of degree d. Its coefficients are in zp. So that's kind of cool because this is a polynomial that, in principle, can be just written down efficiently. You know, it's a univariate polynomial. It's of degree d, so it has like d plus one coefficients. That's not too many. That's polynomially many. Zp. These are numbers of like two n bits long. So one could, in principle, if one knew what it was, just write it down. No, d is polynomial in n. Oh. In this particular case, it's uh, 3m. Yeah. At most 3m. P is like exponential in n. So, um, right, so, you know, he implicitly challenges Merlin. Just give it to me. What are its coefficients? I should say this is like you know how we might imagine it happening in life, but really this does not correspond to any actual step in the protocol. This is just the motivation. In the actual protocol, like Merlin just starts by like blurting out a univariate polynomial, okay? <laughs> but it's supposed to be this one. Okay, that's why I was saying like you kind of have to like sort of motivate what's going on, especially in the case where Merlin is acting honestly uh, as you go. Um, okay. So the honest Merlin, or even the dishonest Merlin, sends over some univariate polynomial of degree at most d with coefficients in z mod p. But let's write it like this. Let's say Merlin sends some g prime of y uh, explicitly. And as I said, this is you know d coefficients in z p. So that's um, you know order n d bits. Okay. In these inter inter interactive proofs, like all the messages have to be polynomial length, the polynomial number of messages, Arthur acts in polynomial time. Uh, and I wrote g prime y because I want to reserve g y for like the actual true polynomial, and g prime y for just like whatever Merlin says. So in the case where the claim is true and Merlin is acting honestly, Merlin will actually send g prime being g, but in general, could be some other univariate polynomial. <clears throat> okay, so now Arthur gets this, and um, Arthur does some checks. So uh, supposedly, you know, this g prime y is this piece, where y uh, stands for x1. So one component of Merlin's implicit claim is that g prime, when summed over all y's from 0 to 1, gives this c. So Arthur checks that. Mod p. Okay, and when I say that like Arthur checks something, what that means is that like okay, if the check passes, things go on, and if the check uh, does not pass, like Arthur stops and rejects. Okay, so that's good, um, but you know Arthur is still suspicious about whether you know g uh, of y, the thing that's truly related to f is actually the same as the thing that Merlin sent. Okay? I mean, it's no trouble for like Merlin to send over some univariate polynomial such that when you evaluate at 0 and evaluate at 1, it adds up to c. But, you know, it has to check that it's related to what's going on. So um, you know, the, the rest of the protocol will be about Arthur trying to get convinced that this is the case. 
And of course, G and G prime are you know, relatively low degree polynomials, and Arthur is trying to check that they're identical. And this is a situation we faced, ourselves, uh, faced several times before. How do you check that two polynomials are identical over a field? Yeah, you pick a random value and check that they evaluate to the same value on this random value. And, um, you know, luckily, due to the great nature of low degree polynomials, this is like a great easy check you can do in the sense that if, if they really are identical, of course, they'll evaluate to the same thing on a random point. But conversely, if they're not identical, even if they're just very slightly non-identical, then they'll disagree on almost all values. So just checking equality on one value is a great way to check that they're formally equal. Good, so this is what Arthur will do. Arthur will next pick R in Z, P, uh, uniformly at random. Okay, this is the part of the protocol where Arthur needs to use uh, randomness. Okay, and, um, you know, Arthur has G prime, so he can simply compute G prime of R. And let's call that um, C2. This is all mod P. And, okay, let me not erase this key claim. Okay, sorry to continue from this board to this board, but... Okay, so now, you know, he needs uh, to be convinced that this G of uh, R is C2. Okay, G is something that he cannot easily compute for himself. It's a pretty complicated polynomial. Um, good. And this is, you know, equivalent to saying, uh, well, let me write it like this. What is this G of R? It's sum over x2 and 0, 1, sum over x3 and 0, 1, sum over xn and 0, 1 of f of r, and then x2 through xn. Okay, and this thing, we could just call this f2 of x2 through xn. I mean, R is some totally fixed scalar here, so we can just uh, let F2 denote the polynomial you get from F by plugging in R for X1. And you see we're exactly back in a star scenario. Okay, there's like some number that Arthur knows, some polynomial F2 that Arthur can evaluate for himself, because he had the original F, and like he can always just manually plug in R for X1. Um, and our, Merlin's implicitly making the claim, you know, when he's implicitly claiming that G prime is G, in particular, that's implicitly claiming that this identity holds. Okay, so I mean, if you want to insert some more like commentary into the proof, like Arthur would now say, so if, if G prime is G, as you're really claiming, then you must in particular be claiming that, you know, C2 equals this, right? And Merlin will say, yes, I am. Um, Okay, I, Arthur should, I guess, inform Merlin what R is, but he can certainly do that. Um, good. And in some sense, that's the whole protocol. We're then going to just, like, continue inductively. Okay, so we've reduced, the, you know, trying to verify the original claim to trying to verify basically the same kind of claim, but with one fewer variable. I guess I should also mention that the degree of F2 has not gone up, it's only potentially gone down. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the analysis, but it hopefully follows all the intuitions that I've said so far. Um, any questions? Yeah. So what happens when you reach the base case, um, when you set the signs to all of them? Uh, good. Yeah, so the base case, which I'll um, get to, is that, uh, oh, maybe I'll just say it now. Um, the base case when n is 1, actually the base case can even be when n is uh, 0. Um, Arthur can evaluate for himself the base case. 
Well, let's say the let's say the base case for you know not try to be extra fancy is n equals one. Um, which I guess would look like this, uh, some c n, which Arthur knows. It's the sum over x n goes from 0 to 1 of some like f n of just x n, where again, this is like a polynomial that like Arthur knows explicitly. It's really the original polynomial f with like some certain values plugged in for all x1 through x n minus 1. And then this, Arthur can verify for himself whether or not it's true. So he doesn't need Merlin's help, so he'll you know, be exactly convinced about the truth or falsity of this statement. He can probably even like, stop when like, you know, there's like, a constant number of variables left. And so he's got that part. But. OK, so let's just talk a little about the analysis. And um, you know, there's two things to check, like when the claim is true, Arthur accepts with probability 1, and that's usually trivial. I mean, it's sort of by design. We'll see. And this is the main thing to check. So if the original claim is correct, or actually if any intermediate claim is correct, well, then Merlin just plays honestly. Merlin answers honestly. And, you know, all the checks pass, everything's cool, Arthur gets down to a true identity in the end, he sees that it's correct, and like Arthur accepts with probability 1. Okay, so the main um, thing to be concerned about is what if the initial claim is false? Can Merlin trick Arthur into accepting? Um, yeah, let's see. Let me write it here. Okay, suppose on the other hand that the initial claim is actually false. But like you still should still imagine that like a, you know, a, 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 Dinus Honest Merlin is still trying to convince Arthur that it's true. So um, what we'll show that either, like in this protocol, Arthur catches Merlin, you know, uh, here, or else Merlin is forced into another false claim. with high probability. Um, you know, this, that he'll be forced into like a false inductive claim. And that's going to be good. Let me write it this way. Forced into another false claim. Instead of saying with high probability, I'll say except with small probability. And what is the small probability going to be? It's going to be literally at most uh, d over p. And this is really small because p is something like 2 to the 2n, 4 to the n. d is polynomial. So this is you know, polynomial over 4 to the n. It's actually even much smaller than, I don't know, 1 over 2 to the n or something like that. And why is that good enough? Um, because uh, we can union bound over all the rounds, the inductive statements, okay? So this is good enough because there's like only, you know, n, at most n inductive, you know, subclaims. And so if in each one Arthur either catches Merlin in a lie, let's say including the case where you get down to the base case and Arthur can detect a false claim himself, if either in each one Arthur catches Merlin a lie, or he forces them into a false claim, uh, except with probability at most 1 over 2 to the n, then the overall probability that he'll never be able to catch Mer Merlin, and Merlin fully cheats him, is at most n over 2 to the n. OK, and that's low probability. Uh, does that make sense? OK, so good. 
Let me erase this board, if that's okay. <coughs> okay, so why is this? Okay, well, say it's really a false claim star, so C really actually doesn't, this is all mod P of course, doesn't equal the sum, sum, sum of F of X. So, basically, in this scenario, Merlin cannot send, I mean, a halfway smart Merlin cannot send the actual G. Because then he'll be caught immediately. So by definition, if he sends the true G, then G0 plus G1 will not equal C. So he has to send some false G. So then we get into a situation where G1 prime of Y is different from G of Y. Okay. And these are distinct degree D polynomials. And therefore, they can agree on at most D uh, points or values in ZP. Right? Because their difference is a degree D polynomial, and a degree D polynomial over a field has at most D zeros. It's the most basic and crucial fact about polynomials. So basically, when Arthur chooses this R, he's almost surely going to uh, force Merlin into another lie. Okay, so therefore, except with probability, what I said, except with probability at most uh, d over uh, p, um, you know, g prime of R will be different from g of R. Okay, and so the next claim is false. Okay. And that's the end of the proof. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah. Is there a reason you can't just be like a polynomial that's sufficiently locked with respect to N or with respect to D? Uh, good question. Uh, well, the question was why couldn't P be, let's say, a polynomial that's like poly n? Um, the only reason is uh, at the very beginning where we said, oh, the true answer for the number of satisfying assignments is some integer between 0 and 2 to the n. So as long as P is bigger than that, taking that mod P doesn't matter. Um, but that's it. Uh, in fact, when we do IP equals P space, we'll get into a situation where P can be like polynomial in N, it'll be, yeah, that's it. You just need to be this like a small enough polynomial that you can, in N, that you can union bound over at N times. Another question? Uh, so if you replace AM with ND, the part that breaks is that we have to check like D plus one point seven to one time plus one? So you say when you, if you replace IP with NP? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, interactive proofs with yeah, yeah. Like, maybe AM. Like Arthur certainly needs to be randomized, but like if you ignore that, you're saying why like Merlin cannot just send everything all at once? Yeah, I guess not NP. But what I mean is if if you want Arthur to be certain. So Oh, you want Arthur to be a hundred percent certain? Yeah. Ha, huh, yes, because you know, uh Arthur doesn't really have access to this polynomial G per se. He can, um, he can't easily uh, evaluate it himself. Uh, he can evaluate F, but maybe he cannot like, this, this, this G of Y is, you know, I mean, if you fix some number for Y, it's like you plug in some value for X1, like you're still left with computing this. This is basically like a sharp P problem, like compute. This is actually a point I'll make just now. Um, computing G of Y is like computing this, basically, with some number plugged in for X1. And that's basically the canonical sharp P problem, like computing the, the exponential, the sum of some exponentially many quantities. 
So Arthur needs like Merlin's help in order to get convinced of that. Any more questions? Just to come back, I mean, I, I know that it actually doesn't matter, but like still for understanding. The prime thing? Yeah, the prime yeah. thing. So if we change like the prime thing to just like some big number and just will evaluate not mod that number, but like pick a random number from like 1 to k, where k is big, and just evaluating exactly the, the value of polynomial, will that work? Um, so at this stage, you want to just not, you know, work mod prime, but just like pick a random number between one and some like very large number. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, good. So let's actually take a, before we get to IP equals P space, which is some souped up version of this kind of, uh, let's take a little interlude to think about exactly this question that arose, which is, um, Normally in interactive proofs, we always say, you know, Merlin is all powerful, unbounded computational power, and it doesn't even have to be modeled by a Turing machine. It can just be literally any function that takes the entire transcript of the messages said so far and the input and like outputs some next message. But let's actually think in this specific case how powerful Merlin actually needs to be. And this is always in the honest case. If like Merlin wants to play honestly, how powerful does Merlin need to be? Okay, and I'm going to be like a very slightly imprecise here because of this classic annoyance about the difference between like decision problem and a function computing problem. But basically, what does Merlin need to be able to do? Like, for example, he needs to like tell Arthur the original answer, C, that he's claiming. Okay, so he has to be able to compute the answer to the initial sharp sat problem himself. So that's basically the power of sharp P. And then, I mean, imagine if like Arthur was literally like a Turing machine, then like, okay, Arthur, Merlin is going to be asked some subsequent questions. Basically, he's going to be asked like to compute this G of Y. Um, and as we said, that's, uh, you know, g of y is like this polynomial. Um, and Merlin can, uh, let's say, compute the value of this polynomial on um, any point he wants. Because it's exactly if he has the power of sharp p, because it's basically a sharp p problem. I guess it's not immediately clear that like Merlin can actually get the coefficients of that univariate polynomial. Um, but that's probably pretty easy, right? Like you have this implicit degree d univariate polynomial. You can compute its values on however many points you want. So you can also get its coefficients, right? You could compute its values on, I guess, d plus one points and then interpolate. Okay, so basically what I'm saying here is like in order for an honest Merlin to do the job, he just needs to have the power of sharp p, basically. The ability to compute, you know, sharp p uh, functions. Okay, so, um, you know, the ability to compute sharp p functions, or maybe the, the power of p to the sharp p suffices. And this is um, a moderately interesting observation that actually Merlin doesn't really need to be, have more power than the ability to like, you know, answer the original claim. Yep. Sorry, back going back to you, how you can compute the value mm -hmm. of um, like you have y for some y yep. sharp p. Um, how I'm not like like I agree that this seems like a sharp p thing, but can you just talk a little bit more about that? It's not really clear because you're trying to get some big value. Um, sharp p like the number. Of yeah, I was trying to avoid that, but let's see if we can actually do it. <laughs> um, well, remember what is sharp p, right? It's like the number of satisfying assignments for like a, or sorry, the number of like, uh, you know, guess bit strings that lead to acceptance in a non-deterministic Turing machine. So like, of course, like, let's say, you know, he was really trying to compute this and like, this is seven. 
Um, so basically, when you get to a leak, you can just like branch um, yeah. like a bunch of times and then accept on the branches where the number is less than the number you're trying to produce. Very good. So like after you've you know used the x two three x n as your guess bits, you have them. So like at the end, having guessed them. Um, you know seven, and you know a bunch of numbers between zero and one, and then you can literally compute this integer yourself. Um, and in this case, it's going to be non-negative, so that's good. And then, like maybe the answer is you know a thousand, or it could even be some exponentially large number. But as you say, you then just have to like manually create the exact right number of accepting branches at this um, at this node. Why is it non-negative? Um, because if you re oh. Oh, well, hmm. Oh, yeah, that's good, actually, right? So you can, you can compute this number, work mod p to get a non-negative number and so forth. Okay. This is all actually um, a moot point for the story, but uh, it's, uh, I basically want to say that. Um, in a second, we're going to actually do the proof that TQBF is in p-space. Sorry, it's in. It's definitely in P space. It's in inner uh, uh, IP. It has interactive proofs, and we're going to see the same thing. We'll see that um, the honest Merlin need only be a P space machine. Maybe I won't actually explicitly uh, do it. You can check for yourself after the proof is complete. But like, this is pretty typical. Like, you know, as I said, pretty much everything that's like not crazy is in P space. So you'll see that Merlin only needs the power of P space. Um, I should say, like in contrast, like imagine we were viewing this whole story as one sometimes does in like you know undergraduate complexity. It's just a proof that like um, Cohen P has interactive proofs. Which is like you're trying to convince, uh, Merlin's trying to convince Arthur that a given phi is unsatisfiable. In other words, that this answer is zero. Um, in that scenario, even though Merlin's only trying to convince Arthur of like an unsat statement that this is zero, in order to do the whole business, we don't know any way of doing it other than this whole business. And so Merlin needs the power of sharp p there, even though he's only trying to convince Arthur of like a Cohen p statement. So it's not always the case that like Merlin just needs the power of like being able to answer questions of the base uh, thing that he's trying to convince Arthur of. But for like sharp p and uh, p space or tqbf, it is the case. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that um, because of these things, you can immediately conclude that like sharp 3 sat and tqbf have instance checkers. So this is a proposition. Suppose uh, a language, let me just state it for languages because it's too another, annoying otherwise. And also its complement uh, are in IP. So there's interactive proofs for when a string is in the language and also for when the string is not in the language. Uh, with you know, the honest Merlin being implementable with the power of L. Let me just write it in P to the L. Then L has an instance checker. Uh, the proof is on your homework, so I'll leave it to you. Um, but it's not too hard. Basically, remember what you're trying to do in an instance checker, right? You have this like language um, L, and somebody gives you like a circuit that they claim decides L, and you don't necessarily want to check them per se, but you just still want to be able to correctly answer questions about whether a given X is in L. So, roughly speaking, um, you know, when you're trying to answer such claim, I guess I'm giving you a slight hint here, right? Like you just try to do the uh, interactive proof about the claim that X is in L, let's say. And of course, you know, Arthur needs to like have a Merlin for that. Well, I mean, Arthur could just use the supposed circuit C for L as his Merlin because the suppos supposedly Merlin only basically needs the power of L to give the answers. So Arthur can just like try it out and like see what happens. You know, the strong guarantees of IP that you're, you know, you're not convinced of false claims hopefully does the job. Well, 
you'll, you'll work it out, but it's not too complicated. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of something going on, because you need the, uh, both L and L bar to be an IP, but you'll figure it out. Um, OK, so as a, a corollary of this proposition, I mean, it's not like an amazing corollary or anything, because we partly already saw it. But um, you know, this is one way to show that uh, things have languages have instance checkers. So TQBF and Sharp 3 sat. It's not strictly a corollary because that's not a language, but anyway, it follows. And graph isomorphism. If you think about the non-interactive protocols for being in the language graph isomorphism and also for being not in the language graph isomorphism, both the cases, basically Merlin only needs to be able to solve graph isomorphism problems. So these all have instance checkers. Okay, so last time I actually proved it explicitly for a sharp three sad, and I just told you it was true for TQBF and graph isomorphism, but this is the reason. Um, and as we said, that has like a further corollary, like then you can show that if uh, this language is in p slash poly, then it's also in MA. And let me just finally add that like, um, <clears throat> it looks like there's a close connection here between interactive proofs and instance checkers, but there's sort of a notable difference. In some sense, let me not be totally precise here, but the reverse is not necessarily true. In the sense that, um, you know, to have a language be in IP, have an interactive proof, is like harder or stronger having an instance checker than having an instance checker. Okay, and uh, what precisely this means gets a little bit into this question, but uh, that's on the homework. But basically, the scenario in an instance checker is that like Merlin has kind of committed in advance to a strategy. It's like, you know, in the instance checker scenario, you have this circuit that you're going to be using as Merlin, and like it's there. Like Merlin cannot like change a strategy or anything. He has to kind of commit to it in the form of a circuit in advance. Whereas being, to show that something is in uh, IP, Arthur has to even be successful at, you know, dodging false claims from like an adaptive Merlin that can kind of not really commit in advance to any strategy, but like wait to see what questions Mer Arthur asks before he decides what to do. Okay, so that's just to say a little bit that like this thing we did today, showing that Sharp 3 sat has an interactive proof system, is kind of stronger than what we did last time, showing that it has an instance checker for this reason. Any question? Yeah. It's not really clear why uh, adapting your strategy is different than the strategy. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I could say much okay. beyond like an intuitive level, but if you think about this protocol, right, like, In some sense, um, in this sense, like in this protocol, like Merlin is basically a machine that like gives back um, univariate polynomials. Um, sort of, what does Arthur actually send? Arthur sends these R's eventually. So Merlin's like a machine that gives back like universal univariate polynomials when prompted by some R's. And um, I guess, let me see if this makes sense. I'll try it out and we'll see what we think about it. Um, in the instance checking scenario, like Merlin has to kind of convince its in, commit in advance to like one mapping from like R's that are prompts to like univariate polynomials that he's gonna send. Whereas an interactive protocol, like, you know, maybe Ar Arthur's like told him like 15 R's as the protocol has gone along. And like on the 16th one, you know, R is seven. Merlin can decide what univariate polynomial to give based on seven, not just as a function of seven, but as a function of the first 15 messages. Uh, I was thinking more like, Mer like Merlin can be non-deterministic in the IP. Like here, Merlin, has to uh, 
uh, implement a deterministic strategy when you get, like, I think that Merlin didn't have access to all the previous R's, even in the circuit case. No, in the, so in the, the model in the instance checker case is that, like, Merlin is like an oracle, which is like a fixed function. Like, if you imagine having a circuit in your hands, it only takes as input, like, um, one question. Uh, maybe we should figure this out offline, but, like, um, I think so. So basically, if you have a circuit for like solving that problem, then that's true that like Archer can, on his own, compute this polynomial using that circuit, right? Like using the power of short p in that circuit. But that polynomial that he gets in the end, not always the same as Merlin will send him on that, like, inter like on that part of the interactive proof because maybe he wants to cheat, right? Yeah, like in this, this scenario, right? Like yeah. once Arthur like picks an R, it's like effectively plugged in for you know the first variable, and that defines like some polynomial G Y. And the question of like what is that G as a function of um, some previously picked R's is the kind of question that the uh, hmm. Yeah. Merlin can't keep state across times, right? Pardon me? Merlin can't keep state across and Yeah, I guess it's a little bit unclear because we haven't like extremely precisely defined like the problem of like what Merlin's supposed to do. Like um because there's like a little bit here where like, you know, Merlin has like some power, but like you actually in this case you like feed that power through like a TQBF oracle. So like you don't it's not like you explicitly ask some sharp p question, there's like another reduction that converts it to like an instance of sharp 3 sat. And like the, the, the oracle Merlin just answers like sharp 3 sat problems. Um, yeah. OK, it's not super clear. So let me think about it and try to get back to you. I, I'm pretty sure there's like a difference in this way, but it's not totally clear at this instant. OK, so. Uh, good. Well, we'll do as much as we can for IP equals P space in 20 minutes. Um, basically, there's one clear idea, and then um, in some sense, like you just say, well, uh, the remainder of the proof is just like in uh, sharp P having an interactive protocol. And although that's true, like it kind of takes some thought to really accept that that's true, which we may or may not have time to for, but you can all reflect about it at home. Um, okay, so we're trying to show that TQBF, now uh, the complete problem for P space has an interactive uh, protocol. So uh, what does an input for TQBF look like? It looks like a totally quantified Boolean formula. I'll call it phi. And it looks like this. For all x1, there exists x2. These are all just bits, uh, such that for all x3, etc. I have it starting with a for all here and ending with an exist, but they always alternate. Uh, but whether this is exist or for all depends on the parity of n, and you can also start with an exist if you want. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then finally, some propositional formula, which uh, without loss of generality is a 3CNF. Okay. Sometimes it could be any propositional formula here, but it's also true that TQBF remains P space complete when this is just a 3CNF. Okay. <coughs> Um, right, so we're trying to imagine that like this is the input, phi is the input, like big phi, cat little phi is uh, explicitly given, and Merlin is trying to convince Arthur that this is true, that it's true that for all bits x1, there exists a bit x2 such that, etc., such that phi gets made true. What's happening with the x's here? The input is going directly to the, the DSC now? Uh, right. What's the quantifiers for? Um, this is a this is like a, a, a second order, you know, first order logic statement, and the question is to decide if it's true or not. So, like for just like three sat, we normally write it like this, but like, and we ask, is there an assignment that makes it true? But like, perhaps a more proper way to write it would be like just say like, is this statement true? That's like another way to write like three sat. I guess I was confused as to why there's an input put in the, the. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Good. Yeah. 
these are, um, you know, dummy variables. So yeah, this is just fine. Thank you. Good. So uh, as before, um, we're just gonna like everybody's gonna imagine like immediately replacing this by you know this f of x1 through xn, which is a polynomial of degree at most 3m computing uh, phi of x on zero one inputs. <coughs> okay. So uh, how's Merlin going to try to convince Arthur that this statement is true? Well, um, an idea is that, um, you know, before it was kind of like we uh, replaced the there exists by like a sum. Okay, and like the sum was actually stronger in the sense that it like counted something. But if you just relax for a bit and like you only cared about whether or not the final answer was uh, whether something existed or not, it was equivalent to asking whether this was zero or non-zero. Okay, so if you kind of relax to that point of view, then it looks like you could be in good shape if you just replace uh, for all by product. You know, product over x1 and 0, 1. Okay, and uh, actually if you did that, you can leave the, for, the exists as a sum and then ask whether like this whole expression is zero or non-zero. Or we're eventually gonna actually do the proper thing of replace this exists by like some little formula that computes the or of two things, but never mind about that for now. The idea is just uh, you could replace this and then try to do the same protocol as before. And that kind of works. Um, the only trouble is that the degree gets very large. You see, when you do that, if you think of, you know, making all these replacements, that creates like a giant polynomial in x1 through xn. But unfortunately, its degree is very large because this thing's degree initially was maybe 3m, which is n cubed or something. And summing is, doesn't increase degree, which was helpful. But like if you multiply, um, the degree can go up, it can square. Okay, so this thing could go up to like n to the n or something like that. And um, at first you might say, oh, that's not even such a big problem because, you know, one thing that the degree controlled was like the probability of catching Merlin in a lie about the equality of two univariate polynomials. Even if it's exponentially big, we can make the prime even bigger. So that's not a problem. But the problem is simply in the first part where like Merlin sends you some univariate polynomial like now, that univariate polynomial would have like exponential degree, and like Merlin cannot just like write down all the coefficients for Arthur. Does that make sense? So that's a shame, but okay, it's a good start. Uh, so what is idea two? That was weird. Uh, Idea two, actually Shamir got around this, the original prover, in a different way. Uh, but then uh, Sasha Shen shortly thereafter gave this different proof that people somewhat prefer. Um, here's the thing. See, we only care about f's value on zero one inputs. in some sense. And if you only care about a polynomial's value on zero, one inputs, it kind of, it, uh, there's no point in having squared uh, variables, if you can help it. Or some higher power of xi, because it's the same from your point of view as xi. Okay, that might change the value uh, on, you know, non-zero one inputs, but if you only care about the value on zero one inputs, then every time you have like a power greater than one, you can just say, well, it would be the same thing if I had xi. So um, there's a situation here. In other words, like um, f equals on zero one to the n inputs, the multilinearization of f
where by the multilinearization of a multivariate polynomial, I mean, just go through every term, and like whenever you have a power on x that's bigger than 1, just reduce it down to 1. Um, and if that could somehow like auto magically happen, like in this protocol, then things would be great because when you multilinearize an n-variate polynomial, the degree is at most n. So like the degree does not get like exponentially large and things would be fine. The only trouble is like it's unclear from Arthur's point of view like how to like make this happen because you know he's sitting there just with f. It's like some non-multilinear polynomial that's in his hands. Um, and now he kind of wants to be working with the multilinearization of it, which is formally a different polynomial, which has different values on the non-zero one inputs. And like, how's Arthur going to even evaluate that? I mean, he can at least evaluate the original f on zero one inputs, but like, it's not even clear how he can evaluate the multilinearization on zero one inputs, even though that's all he needs to do. But of course, Merlin's going to help him with that. Um, so let me introduce some new notation for this multilinearization. I'm going to call it um, L1, L2 through Ln of f, where Li is like a multilinearization operator on the ith variable. Okay, so Li um, multilinearizes on xi. And what that means is, just for a notation, I'll say what happens to L1. If I apply this operator L1 to a polynomial f, uh, I just mean this new polynomial, x1 f of 1 through x2 through xn plus 1 minus x1 f of 0 x2 through xn. Okay, let me summarize here. I just invented like an operator on polynomials, in this case called L1, um, which does this to a polynomial. And this is cooked up, if you think about it, it's, uh, it has exactly this property. It has the effect of turning f into the polynomial that you get if you take, replace every high power of x1 with just x1. OK. Uh, So this um, operator it like changes the polynomial. Uh, it has two effects. It, it, it multilinearizes x1, so it gets its degree down to 1. And it preserves the value of the polynomial on uh, 0, 1 inputs for x1. Because right? multilinearization doesn't change values uh, when you put in input 0 or 1. Uh, okay, so basically we're going to do this idea of replacing, you know, for all by a product, which is also some kind of operator on polynomials, plugging in zero for the first variable, plugging in one for the first variable, and multiplying together. It's like an operator which unfortunately has the property that it really increases degree a lot. Uh, but we're going to like sprinkle in this like uh, multilinearization operator like everywhere here and attempt to keep the degree down. So in fact, let me. In the same way I'm thinking of like this Li as some kind of like operator on polynomials, let me introduce one for uh, for all and exists. So whenever we have like for all x1 f, I'm going to kind of replace that with like an operator that I'll call like pi1 of f, where pi1 of f is this polynomial operator. Okay, so again, you can think of this pi1 as like a formal operator on polynomials that does this to it. It has some interesting effect too. One effect that it has is it gets rid of x1. x1 no longer appears in pi1 of f. Uh, downside of it is that the degree goes up. Um, but again, it has like, it preserves, like if f is computing 0, 1 values on 0, 1 inputs, then this guy computes like the and of s values when you, uh, over x1 being 0, 1 when these guys are 0, 1 inputs. Okay, so semantically, it's doing the right thing on for computing this for all on 0, 1 inputs. And similarly, you know, let's just do it properly with there exists. Instead of replacing it with sum, which is not quite right for Boolean values, we'll just you know, do the operator that computes the or over x1 equals 0, 1. So let me introduce some like goofy notation, like the upside down version of pi. 
which is, okay, now we have to multilinearize uh, or, it's just uh, this. If you want to do like A or B, that's the same as A plus B minus AB over 0, 1. So it's this operator on polynomials, F of 1 through X2 through Xn plus F of 0 on X2 through Xn minus the product. Okay, so again, this is like now like a formal operator on polynomials uh, that has some good sides and bad sides. The good side is that um, it gets rid of x1, no longer appears, and it sort of semantically computes the there exists thing when everything is like 0, 1 inputs. The downside is also the degree goes up to uh, potentially squares here, because you also have a times down here. Um, okay. So what I'm saying, therefore, is that uh, <coughs> check out this crazy expression. Um, if we replace little phi by this multilinear polynomial f, then phi is equal on 0, 1 to the n inputs uh, to like pi 1. And then I'm going to like linearize uh, the first variable. Then I'll do my exists on the second variable. And then I'm going to linearize on 1 and 2. Then I'll do pi 3. And there's lots of things here. And then the last one, let's say the last one is there exists. That's just like upside down pi. And, and then I'll linearize everything. And then I'll put 5. Oh, f, I guess. Okay, so it's getting a little elaborate looking, but um, the claim here is that um, when you plug in 0, 1 truth values for the x's here, this whole thing uh, is 0 or 1, and it's 0, 1 according as whether phi is true or not under the truth value that you plugged in. Um, let's buy these like semantic checks. This really means a for all or and. This really means exists or or. And um, this does not change any value when you plug in zeros and ones. Um, and why do we do this? Well, the, the reason is that at every like uh, sort of intermediate point throughout this uh, operated on formal polynomial, you have a low degree polynomial. Okay, so as we saw, let's look at the degrees like here, if you will, when you just have f of x, this thing had degree at most 3m, which is polynomial in n. Okay? But it potentially has very high degrees on all the individual variables. It's like the product of a bunch of, you know, degree three things. You know, each individual xi degree can be as large as m. But, like, once you start this multilinearization, all the individual degrees go down to at most 1. So actually, at this point, Every degree is, uh, individual degree is at most 1, so the overall degree is at most n. Now this thing can bring the degrees back up because it has this times in it. Okay, but like it maybe brings it back up to, you know, this has degree probably at most n minus 1, this is degree at most n, n minus 1, you multiply them together, the degree is at most 2n minus 2, let's just say it's at most 2n. So here the degree is at most 2n. Okay, and some of the variables might now have quadratic degree, but then like you multilinearize them all back. Um, and uh, let me also mention that like after you do this operation on the nth variable, uh, the polynomial here no longer depends on xn. So that's like we, why we don't bother like multilinearizing with respect to the nth variable because it's no longer in the polynomial. Okay, so every time we hit like one of these pi's or inverse pi's, it gets rid of one variable. Maybe it increases the individual degrees up to like two, but then we like multilinearize all the variables that are left. The degree goes back down to n, and uh, we proceed. Okay, so this expression is only like n squared symbols long, and it has the property that like all the intermediate formal polynomials have degree at most, usually I in fact at most 2n, but, or, yeah, but anyway, poly n. OK, 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, now's the part where I just say, well, it's like the sharp PA thing, uh, and you can check for yourself. That is true, although you kind of have to think about it. And uh, you can also read the textbook because it's in there, although they also do it very fast. But basically, the interactive proof system is going to be about Merlin com uh, claiming to Arthur um, that uh, this evaluates to the constant polynomial 1. So the interactive proof is um, sort of much like before. You know, the initial claim is that like this enormous thing, you know, equals 1 mod p, I suppose. We can do the prime thing. <coughs> and Arthur kind of basically tries to verify it like operator by operator. Okay, so roughly speaking, like in the beginning, this whole piece uh, is a univariate polynomial in X1. Of low degree. So again, okay, I'm basically out of time, so I'll say things in words. You know, Arthur can demand Merlin just tell him that polynomial by giving its coefficients. And it's low degree, so Merlin can do that. So Merlin now, Arthur has like a claimed polynomial in x1. And um, pi 1 of that polynomial is just the product of the values on when you plug in 1 or 0 for x1. So Arthur checks, you know, manually that the polynomial that Merlin sent, called g, has the property that when you plug in 1 and plug in 0 and multiply them together, you get 1 mod p. So that's all well and good, but then like Arthur has to become convinced that Merlin really did send him this giant univariate polynomial. So you do the same trick as before. You pick a random number mod uh, p, call it r. Arthur tells that to Merlin. And so Merlin sort of, and if Merlin was cheating, you know, there's a very high chance that he'll be forced into a cheat again um, because it's a low degree polynomial. Uh, okay, so then you use, Merlin's like forced into like another claim that looks like this. Um, you know, with a different right-hand side and like a value plugged in for x1. And then you kind of repeat the whole thing with all these different operators. And it actually, in all three cases, like, you know, you just demand the univariate polynomial that uh, you get when you um, only uh, leave the first variable that remains free. And you just do three different checks, either this check, this check, or this check. Verify that it's true and induct. Um, so it all sounds fine, and it is fine, but it's kind of worth thinking about a little bit carefully once in your life, because for example, mm, the linearization operators don't actually kill any variables. It's fine, but you know, just, you know, that mentally goes into these things. And I don't know if you will or will not be surprised by this, but if I tell you that like all of these univariate polynomials that Merlin is sending, they're actually either all degree one or degree two. So actually not even high degree. They're all degree one or degree two. If you don't think about it carefully, you might be like, whoa, that's weird, but it's true. So I encourage you to think carefully about like what goes on, but on the other hand, I do assure you that it actually ends up just being the same as in the sharp P protocol. Okay, any questions? All right, so on Thursday, we're gonna switch gears and start talking about circuit complexity.